Hey everyone, this is Chris Tiroff, Traverse Creek Incorporated. Today I want to talk about a couple of my favorite saws, these uh, McCulloch 1010s. These, this series of saw kind of started out in the 60s, ran all the way till I think the late 90s. Uh, pretty cool old saws. They're pretty loud and they vibrate like crazy, but they make a lot of power. They're kind of like a pretty neat hot rod. And uh, I just came across a few of these and in the last week or so I've been fixing them up. Um, and they're just pretty cool overall. And uh, I just always like to check them out and get another one of these running. So what I'm going to do today is I'll do like a basic overview of one of these. I like take it apart and show you some of the details. Now, all of these are kind of different over the years. Like I said, they started making them in the 60s. So there's, and they finished making them like in the 90s. These are all kind of like late model ones, probably made in the 90s with electronic ignition and stuff in them. But uh, they had a lot of different things going on with them over the years. So uh, we're going to cut right into that scene, and I'll be uh, showing you uh, what one of these looks like under the covers here. Okay, so now we're, we're here, and uh, we're looking at this close up. This is a McCulloch Pro 1010 automatic. They had a lot of different names. It was all kind of like the same thing, Super 1010, 1010 automatic, Pro automatic, whatever. They just kept hashing the name around, and that's what McCulloch did with a lot of their, their stuff. Um, like I said, these are all, all the ones that I had on the table were all late model ones with like electronic ignition, left hand start, um, chain brakes. But over the years, you know, and like originally they had, I think McCulloch carburetors on them. This one has a Walboro SDC. Uh, the, the original ones had points. This has electronic. I think the original ones had the right hand start that McCulloch was kind of known for in those days. Uh, but they, they opted to go with the left hand start and uh, with the right hand start you just had like a cover uh, no chain break I still have one of the covers here that I could show you this was like what the right hand starter cover so like your spring your starter spring your everything were in here and also your tensioner it was all kind of integrated into this cover probably not too bad of an idea but the problem was you're trying to make everything work inside here like you've got your you've got your starter and that's got to line up properly and then you've got your tensioner and everything and just over time everything kind of like wears out and um, you know everything starts to kind of get messed up inside of them so they started going with this left hand start which kind of more solid more solid design more durable design it makes more sense but a lot of their saws in those days were were right hand start so the early ones had uh, a different style top cover on them. You still got it off, I think, with a screw. I don't know, they made so many changes over the years. But they had a dome style air filter. This one has the flat type. And I'll show you that. This one has the flat type. And then this has that Walboro SDC cube style carburetor. Oh, baby, those snubbers are about to break. Now, the way that the... Um, the way that the linkages stay on the carburetor is they're kind of loose in there by themselves, but then this little rubber uh, part here, this here, is called a snubber, and then this creates tension on the two, squeezes them together, and then it holds that into the carburetor. Your fuel line goes from right here up into the fuel tank, and then it's super easy to replace the fuel line. All you got to do is... Uh, now. I just do it without taking the tank apart. And you could just take the line and fish it right through that hole and then through this hole here and then pull it through and then you could just connect it right to the carburetor. Or you could take this screw out here and then these two screws lift the tank off. There's a little gasket that seals the tank and then you could just uh, put it through just like that. Super easy to work on. Um, the tank vent is inside this cap. It's got a little Tank, uh, a little check valve in it. I think some of the older ones had uh, like the duck bill valves in them and stuff. They made, like I said, these were in production for 35 years, I think. So they, they made, or almost 35 years, so they made a lot of changes over the years. And then this is the 10 series uh, non anti vibration chassis. So they made, um, they made it in 54 cc's. So that would be like a lot of your 10 10s. Um, your, your 110, 210, 310, 410, I think, were all 54 cc's. And then, uh, like your Pro Mac 55, your, late, your Pro Mac 555, your late model 1010S were all 57 cc's. And then your, I think it was uh, 
510, 610, 710, Pro Max 700, those were all like in the 70cc range and they're pretty mean saws in their own right. And uh, I, think this, I think this power head only weighs about 12 pounds. A lot of the modern power heads in the 50cc range also weigh about 12 pounds and they're made out of a lot of plastic. But they do have the advantage of a pretty damn good uh, anti-vibration system, which this one completely lacks. This is just an ignorant hot rod uh, woodcut machine in your hands. Uh, they're loud. They're obnoxious. I don't think that they would pass any of the safety regulation that, uh, that we see today uh, at all. And then uh, they have some decent little things to make them pretty easy to start. Uh, you just have your choke, and then you've got your throttle interlock here and operator presence lever. It's all in one. Pretty neat design. Kill switch is here. Um, let's see what else. Oh wait, no, this is, I thought this was an operator presence lever, but it, it seems that the trigger still works without it. So this is just your throttle interlock alone. Manual override oiler. These have an impulse oiler on them instead of a, uh, a gear drive. So a lot of the older, uh, a lot of the older saws started out with impulse oilers, some of the older home lights. Uh, but this has an impulse oiler. It runs basically off a crankcase impulse, similar to the way that the carburetor runs off, off of that instead of a gear driven, like a worm gear driven uh, oil pump. This is, this is the oil tank here. And then uh, your oil pump is actually inside here. And then there's a plunger and stuff in, in there. I'm not gonna take this one apart, but then your, your oil cap, your oil fill cap is here. And then this is actually your oil tank. The cylinder in this is, is horizontal instead of verti vertical, like the, uh, like the modern saws are mostly vertical nowadays, except for the top handles. This is a, horizon a horizontal saw. So the, the, pist the piston, when it moves, it goes this way instead of this way. So this is kind of like a clamshell built uh, design here. And I, 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 I got some short blocks here. I'll see if I can get them on camera and show them off to you a little bit too. But first, so this is your chain brake cover, your tensioner. It's got, it's got the side it's not as good as the modern ones. These are kind of a pain in the ass to put together. You know, whenever you put the bar and chain on there, kind of a pain in the ass. But I mean, it does have a working chain brake on it. Works pretty good. I don't think it's inertia activated like the modern ones are. I think it's just like, just in case you have a situation where it kick, kicks back, the inertia doesn't activate it. It's just your hand being there that, that activates it. Um, but it's, it's the same basic concept as what the, uh, it's the same concept as what the uh, what the modern stuff is nowadays. You just have the band that goes around the clutch drum, and then in the event of kickback, that handle gets pressed forward, the band gets um, compressed, and then that's the end of it. And these got a pretty pretty big meaty clutch on them, pretty heavy duty clutch. Um, the, the they're kind. Of the chain on you gotta you gotta have a certain way that you put when you put the chain on it that you tuck it around here and then get it get it up over onto the rim and uh, you know get get the bar on there and everything but this is this is basically it pretty big like I said pretty big heavy duty clutch there and then a lot of the older saws had the the inner and outer bar plate I'm missing the outer bar plate on this one but a lot of the, the, the modern saws usually have an inner one, and then the outer one is like screwed to the clutch cover. Um, but you know, in the, in the old days, you, you just had like the two, the two loose bar plates that were just kind of floating around, and hopefully you didn't lose them whenever you took your bar off in the woods or whatever. And then here, I'm not gonna take it all the way down, but your muffler kind of starts down in here and it makes its way up because, like I said, the cylinder is horizontally, so, so it lays this way. So your exhaust port is underneath, and you have this. Uh, this is your actual um, where the muffler exhausts out of on the saw. And there ain't much of a muffler there, I'll tell you that much. And we'll take the cover off just to give you an idea of what's going on under there. Like I said, these... This is a late model one that has uh, 
the uh, the electronic ignition, so it's pretty simple under there. And McCulloch did a good job with that. Like they, you know, a lot of the a lot of the ones from around this time frame, you know, they had two piece or you know three piece electronics, or they had a big stator plate. You know, they were still trying to they were still waffling trying to figure out what the best what the best system was. And uh, McCulloch was able to get this. I don't know if they did that, if they designed that in house, or if they, you know, contracted it out. But they were able to get a uh, very good uh, one-piece ignition system that was reliable um, in into a lot of their machines. And one of the things that was nice about McCulloch in, in in those days, I mean, pretty much throughout their whole time in manufacturing, is that they had a lot of compatibility of parts inside like a series of saws like all the 1010s you could make stuff work uh, you know in like a lot of like the big like 700 series or the one dash series max um, with, like the top tanks a lot of stuff w was interchangeable between all those different models so like you could you could always make something work or convert something to a left hand start from a right hand start if you played around enough um, which makes them kind of neat for the collector, somebody that's got, you know, some carcasses and wants to make something work. You usually can pile a max that are all kind of the same from the same time frame and the same the same designs. And you can see like over time how they uh oh, look at this one. This one was actually I didn't I didn't realize this. Um, this one was actually a points one. And then they, they put one of those, well, this is the steel branded chip, but it's the, um, like an Atom chip on it. I didn't realize that. I guess I hadn't gotten into this one. All the other ones were, uh, all the other three that I worked on were all um, electronics. So this one just has the points ignition coil on it. And then, and then the points box is underneath the, uh, the flywheel here. They had a number of different flywheels over the years. Um, different uh, fin count. I believe they're all compatible throughout all the 10 series no matter what type of ignition you had too. So they were pretty smart like that. Then you got this starter cover. Pretty heavy duty. They, they hold up good. Um, they're a little less refined than like the, the modern ones. They're a little bit more challenging to put together because uh, you got like different layers. And like it seems like as time goes on, just like how we were talking about those ignitions, like these old points ignitions, you had the points, the condenser, you had the box, you had the wipers, you had all that stuff, and you had the ignition coil plus all the wires. You had all this stuff, and that's all been narrowed down to just one little ignition coil that does everything now. Even like with the Huskies, I think the ignition coil controls the carburetor. You know, everything gets smaller and smaller and smaller and more simplified and engineered better over the years. And like these starters, these are a great starter, and they work well, and they're reliable, and they're pretty easy to work on. But like a new starter, they're even they're they're way easier to work on than one of these. You know, like this this one here, you still have to worry about the spring coming apart on you, and uh, everything. One thing that these were notorious for is the uh, the grills getting busted up on these starters. Um, but now there's some guys getting them made. Uh, Mark Hyman makes some, and then uh, we, we actually order them from overseas. Um, so if you're missing this grill and you don't want to get caught up in your flywheel, there's options out there for you. Um, so I think that's about as far as I want to take this guy apart here. What we'll do is we'll take a look at that short block that I've got. And then, like I said, these... Well, real quick too, we'll look at the tank. These these tanks, there's so many different variations of them, but they all kind of are interchangeable uh, between the different carburetors and things. They they all, like a lot of the late models use like the SDC carburetor. And the early ones, like the early like 110, 210, I think the 310 and the 410 still used it too, was like what they call like the bullfrog carburetor. They're kind of an oddball thing. McCulloch tried over the years um, to develop their own carburetors uh, with, I, I, I want to say, limited limited success and limited uh, acceptance inside inside the world. Uh, you know, when, whenever they finished up, they they had long forgotten uh, running their own carbs. But something to be said for it, uh, McCulloch was. Uh, 
the first ones to develop and, uh, and use a diaphragm carburetor and a chainsaw, which allowed the chainsaw to be run in any position as opposed to it having to be upright. Because before the, I think it was the 325 that it was on, you had to um, you had to keep the chainsaw in an upright position and then actually pivot the bar in order for it to work. Uh, so here we go. This is a uh, 1010S, which is a late model um, cylinder, uh, the 57 cc. I believe they are a, um, a cast aluminum uh, cylinder with a uh, yeah, cast aluminum cylinder with a cast iron sleeve, no chrome on the inside. Um, and then they just have regular rings. Another interesting caveat about the, um, about the McCulloch saws, at least in this time frame, was that you had the piston pin bearings uh, pressed in to the piston itself, and then the wrist pin was pressed into the crankshaft, and it's, actu it's an actual press fit. Now most of the modern day saws are just like a loose, um, a loose fit with clips in the end. This one you actually have a, a like a really tight press fit, uh, a precision press fit into the crankshaft itself. So uh, that's that's an interesting caveat with these. We we have a special tool that we use because in order to get that out, you can't just take the clips out and slide the pin out. You've got to actually press it out. And if you don't want to damage the piston, you better you better have a good tool for that. And uh, we, we have a little special tool that works pretty good for it that I use if I ever got to get into one of these. And then you can see this is kind of like a modern um, clamshell design. You've got like the split, you know, it's split, the crankcase is split uh, this way so it sandwiches the bearings. Um, they had a small bearing on the flywheel side and a really, really big bearing on the PTO side you can see here. Um, Open port cylinder design, pretty pretty neat design. Uh, there's a bridge in the exhaust, and then just a regular open intake design. Really, a, and, and then this, the late model like 1010s's have the decompression valve on it. These are really a, 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 a great little machine piece. And then your oil tank was the lower portion of the uh, of the saw here. The lower portion of the the crankcase. It was a oil tank and uh, lower portion of the crankcase uh, casting. And then it just this is how it would look uh, right here. Yeah, put together on the saw. So this is this is basically your whole engine. And then everything bolts to that. So this is your. Let's see here. Yeah, this is your. Yeah, there you go. And then everything bolts to that, and then that's basically what you're looking at. There is is this. Oh, maybe I was maybe I was incorrect. I think the big bearing might be on the uh, huh, might be on the flywheel side. Huh, that's interesting. Wonder why they went with a bigger bearing on the flywheel side than on the power takeoff side. I don't know. But yeah, that's that's the way these things went together like this. Um, pretty pretty ingenious design, and then they could make a, a really lightweight chainsaw for the day that was uh, that's that's really super powerful. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take this and, and get this starter cover back on that saw. I don't have any wood here. I'm not really in a great place to cut, but we'll we'll take it out and we'll get it started up, and then you can get an idea of uh, what one of these sounds like at idle, and then what it sounds like uh, fully. You know, blasting out. I mean, they're they they got a pretty cool sound about them. They're they're uh, they're something you definitely want to wear some hearing protection with. So we're going to move into that next. So we're going to start this 1010 up, and you can get an idea of what it sounds like.
All right, guys. Hey, thanks for watching about these uh, McCulloch 1010s and uh, for sitting with us while we uh, go through these. These are definitely one of my uh, favorite saws, and uh, I really like uh, every time I get one of these in here and fool around with it. Uh, so that's it. That's all I got. Thanks so much.